okay, why don't we why don't we go ahead and get started? <laughs> this is this is this is a packed room. I don't know that there are any uh, open seats here. Well, because actually, um, uh, because of actually um, Connor is doing work in the EPC and being a BCB student, um, we kind of have the whole department spanned. Yeah, so this is great. But I always like to see this. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing this every every conference. Uh, uh, just to let people know. Um, so anyways, um, uh, today's sessions, we, we always do at least uh, one of these uh, because we always have people who um, are presenting at the AMIA meeting, the American Medical Informatics Association meeting, which uh, 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 festivities uh, start on Saturday and, and actually go through Wednesday. Um, we always uh, have a big uh, presence there. Um, it's an important meeting, um, actually, uh, um, as I was telling a couple of our clinical informatics fellows last week, um, this is my, this will be my 33rd consecutive meeting, uh, AMIA meeting dating back to 1986, which two of them informed me that that was the year they were born. Um, so which I, I proceeded to, to tweet that and uh, my daughter, who some of you know, who's a medical student said, that was five years before I was born. So. Anyways, um, I guess I've been around a while. And, you know, but the AMIA meeting is always uh, a big event. Actually, one thing, uh, some of you, uh, if you follow our Twitter feed, uh, know that uh, the, there was just the, um, the inaugural class of fellows of AMIA, people who have um, uh, uh, been uh, around and contributing in informatics and to AMIA, um, and 130 people were, um, uh, will be in the uh, inaugural class, and they, uh, posted the list, um, and it turns out that uh, 15 people on that list are alumni of our program. So more than 10% of the um, fellows of AMIA are uh, alumni of, of OHSU, and they're all over the place. Uh, so we were really uh, pleased with that, and I, I'm sure we'll we'll keep those numbers up because there's many more people who are eligible, and uh, hopefully they will uh, achieve that status next year. So anyways, the uh, purpose of, of this session, these talks, is to give people a chance to um, practice in front of an audience uh, um, that um, they will um, be uh, uh, presenting um, in San Francisco this weekend or next week. And um, just to, it's, it's always helpful even for um, uh, those of us who have been doing this for many, many years. Uh, it's still useful. Uh, to uh, to do these practice talks, and then also to give uh, some of you who might not be attending the opportunity to hear the talks. Um, I know that we're, I'll get started in a moment, I promise. Um, I know that we're competing um, with the president, uh, our new president, Danny Jacobs, at noon. Um, uh, I'm told that that will be recorded, so um, you don't really need to leave. Um, Although if you really want to, you can, we'll understand. Uh, but that will be recorded and available so uh, people can, um, uh, whenever it's posted uh, on the intranet, you'll be able to, uh, to view it. Okay, so, um, so we have two talks today. Um, one is, um, who most of you know, one of our uh, esteemed faculty, uh, Dr. Joan Ash, uh, who um, uh, will be presenting her work. And then we also, um, I'll talk a little bit about it, um, but Connor Smith when, um, is presenting in the AMIA Design Challenge. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit before he presents because there's a, another great OHSU story behind that. So go ahead. Thanks, Bill. Is this on? Yes? Good. All right. Uh, so this is supposed to be a 15-minute talk. It's a podium presentation, meaning that I submitted an abstract many, many months ago. Uh, it was accepted. And uh, I get to present it, but it's not a published paper. So we get to actually publish something after this. Uh, these are the co-authors for the presentation. I'd like to thank them. And also ARC for the funding. Jeff Gold is the principal investigator on this particular ARC grant. And our other team members uh, who will be on the final paper um, who have contributed a lot since we wrote the abstract. So Thomas and Chris, Ben and Nick Solberg. So, the title was about scribes, but first we need to define scribes because it's not really very clear what they are. Uh, according to uh, 
the experts, their documentation assistants, uh, so that they assist providers, like this one in the picture, uh, in doing their documentation. And they've really come along since EHR came along. There is no specific licensure for scribes yet, because it's a fairly new industry. CMS, AHIMA, the Joint Commission have published some guidance, but it's not all that helpful. There are no regulations about it. And so part of the problem is this is an unregulated industry. However, uh, it's been shown to be a good industry in that a really good study that just came out in JAMA Internal Medicine, the best probably that's been published so far about scribes, indicates that providers love it. It helps them with their efficiency. It lessens burnout. Patients love it. Scribes love it because they get jobs that they get paid for. The problem is that it is such a fast-growing industry. It's not regulated. And estimates are there are 20,000 scribes in the U.S. right now, and there will be 100,000 by 2020. So when we say fast-growing, it really is fast-growing. So a commentary paper in that same issue of JAMA Internal Medicine by our colleague Dave Bates and Adam Landman uh, actually says, well, yes, there are all these good things about scribes, but on the other hand, uh, they're an unintended consequence of the EHRs, and it, it's probably a short-term workaround, so that we're, especially in informatics, working on other solutions to this documentation problem. But the big problem is that documentation is just an extra burden on providers. So our purpose was to describe activities of medical scribes using the EHR and identify best practices across multiple types of organizations. No one has really sort of identified the industry or the career yet. So our, the ultimate goal after five years is to provide training modules for scribes, and ARC will make those available. So we use this really simplistic, there are many socio-technical model diagrams out there, but we use this very simplistic one uh, so that pretty much everything having to do with informatics and the EHR you can put into these different perspectives, personal, environmental, technical, or organizational. And so we just use this as a framework for looking at scribes. We used our rapid ethnographic process uh, for doing this so that it's team-based. It's a way of gathering and analyzing and doing things fairly quickly. It's a menu of qualitative and quantitative methods. For this, we use qualitative, primarily interviews and observations. And then we used a grounded hermeneutic approach to analysis, which just means an inductive approach. So we gathered a lot of data. Uh, we did, actually, this, we've done a thorough analysis of site A and site B. We've done a lightweight analysis of site C. And we just finished site D last week, so we haven't included that in this analysis yet. So these results are preliminary. Uh, but even up to this point, we had done interviews with 50 different individuals. We had done observations in six clinics and done quite a few hours of observation in those clinics. I should also say that the different models of scribing used at these places were an internal program at an academic institution, um, a company-provided group of scribes at another community organization, and then an ENT clinic where they use a virtual remote model, I guess you would call it. So looking at those different perspectives, after our analysis, we came up with 10 themes, which fall nicely into the four areas. But I'm just going to talk about those in red, because I only have a total of 15 minutes. But basically, we had different perspectives um, of scribes and providers and others, like administrators. Another theme, of course, was training, because that's our ultimate goal. Uh, we're finding scribe-provider interaction is a really, really uh, interesting area. For the environmental side, the whole scribe industry is very interesting, but I'm going to focus more on the compliance and safety issues. From the technical perspective, both the EHR and the ergonomics surrounding the EHR have come up as themes. And then from an organizational perspective, of course, efficiency, the 
quality of documentation and the coding for billing, uh, and then these differing scribe models and variability within them. So from the personal perspective, from the provider's perspective, this is what they look like. When we go out there and we observe, they are so happy to have scribes. Uh, there, there's scribe envy very often when people don't have scribes and other providers get scribes. So they think being able to go home uh, on time is a really good thing, naturally. Um, but the challenges are that at least for the pre-professional model of scribes where these are either college students or graduates who are trying to get into medical school or PA school, pre-professional, of course, they only stay 12 months to 18 months. And so the providers have this burden of constantly adding to their training. Even if a company or a program gives them training, the providers have to give them individual training about the way they do things. Uh, the providers need training also, we're finding. Uh, so we, our whole grant was about training scribes, but we're now thinking that we need to do some provider training as well because some providers use scribes better than other providers. The one thing the providers told us was a big downside is they become too dependent on the scribes. Uh, and we might say, well, there are risks involved in that too and that maybe the providers aren't learning how to use the EHR. In one of our places, that was definitely the case. From the scribe point of view, for the pre-professionals, it kickstarts their careers. They get a letter of reference. They have all this great uh, background before they apply to the professional school. They actually get paid for something uh, in old days they volunteered to do. It may be minimum wage, but they do get paid something. Uh, they're making a contribution and they're constantly learning while they're scribes. On the other side, often they're paid minimum wage. Uh, there's a steep learning curve, especially since many of them start out in the emergency department uh, where everything uh, comes in. Uh, and, you know, sometimes the interactions with providers are not always super positive. Now, some of the scribes may have held back uh, in that they're actually working for the organizations now. Uh, and, and some of the companies have uh, non-disclosure agreements, but the scribes, I think, pretty much told us uh, a straight scoop. From the patient point of view, we didn't talk to patients, but both the providers and the scribes and others told us that patients rarely object. We did find, though, that they must be introduced properly. Uh, they should have, the provider, you know, really should say, this is my scribe, this is my scribe's name, and why the scribe is in the room. Because otherwise, the patients can be really puzzled. And patients often having a third person in the room, they need to know who that third person is. And then this whole idea of the interaction. Uh, the upsides are that if they work together, if a dyad, scribe, provider, dyad, work really well together, they can become incredibly efficient. And they build relationships with one another. Uh, scribes like to be taught. Providers like to teach. The challenges, though, are that constantly recruiting scribes every 12 months to replace a scribe, you know, obviously puts human resources um, challenges uh, in the way. Uh, also, matching the right provider to the right scribe is a challenge. And the providers have to accept a lot of responsibility they may not realize ahead of time. Uh, they need to communicate well with the scribe, provide feedback, do evaluations, and really carefully review the documentation. It's up to them, you know, they're the ones responsible for it. And we found that they don't, if they really trust their scribe, they tend not to check things over as well as they possibly should. From the environmental perspective, there is this guidance available, but and the larger sites and the companies seem to be aware of it, and they try to provide boundaries around what a scribe can do. They are not licensed, and therefore they should not be doing anything with patients. They should not be hands-on with patients at all. That's a pretty strict boundary that we found broken fairly often. Because after all, the scribes want to learn more, and the providers want them to do more. And so together, they're constantly pushing the boundaries. And at the smaller sites, uh, where there's not as much oversight, they may go beyond the boundaries. So that this is a, a bit of a risk to the patients uh, and liability for the organization. From the EHR point of view, the upsides are that the scribes are really good at using the EHR. And in fact, sometimes they're the real go-to 
people uh, for the providers. Um, and it enables standardization of care because the scribe and provider can agree on templates and dot phrases and that kind of thing, which really helps efficiency. And the EHR helps them with that efficiency. But as you know, it takes an investment of time to develop those efficiencies and the templates. As usual, upgrades cause problems and the scribes may be, the scribes don't necessarily work for the organization. They might work for a scribe company. And so sometimes they're a little bit left out of the organizational communication about what's going on with the EHR. And ergonomics are such a huge challenge. I mean, this is typical, but we've also seen uh, the scribes in a very small place with their laptops on their knees, balanced on their knees, um, typing with one hand, sitting on sinks, sitting anywhere they can. Uh, and the rooms haven't been designed for that extra person in the room. The, Industry's only been around for a few years. But that's what I mean by agile. Um, the models of scribing, different models of scribing. There are so many models, sometimes it's hard for organizations to choose from. Um, the pre-professional model, really motivated, really bright people, but they don't stay long. The professional model, where they do stay, um, they are uh, more stable within an organization, um, but they may not have that motivation. The clinical model is when you use MAs, nurses, or others to do scribing, but they have to have a clear differentiation. They have to put on their scribe hat when they do documentation, because it's hard to do your MA thing and your scribing thing at the same time. And there are issues of safety with that. Company versus internal. Uh, the companies do uh, the HR part of it, which sometimes can be too much of a burden for the organization. But then again, the organization has to pay more for that. And th this whole future of virtual or AI-assisted scribing is definitely coming down the pike. It may take over the scribing industry, um, but not tomorrow. But it's an interesting model, and people are playing with it. So each model has its strengths and weaknesses. So there are upsides to using scribes. Everybody says so. The downsides are there are these risks. And what we've learned so far is that it's not on the, on the backs of the scribes. The, the training also has to include the providers so that you can have this very positive interaction that's also uh, producing efficiencies between these dyads of scribes and providers. Doctors save lives. Providers save lives, scribes save doctors. So, thank you. How did. I'll still have to cut it down because they only give us a total of 18 minutes. So, 15 for the talk and three for questions and answers. And I probably talk too fast. Just squeeze it all in, so I'll have to cut something out. Yeah, I have a, a question, um, and, and we'll, um, don't worry, we'll have plenty of time for the second talk. Um, um, it's interesting that, you know, so, some people say, in fact, I think David Bates says this, that, that scribes are, in, in essence, a symptom of how poorly we've designed our EHRs and how difficult they are to use. But you said that it's estimated that the marketplace is going to increase. So um, do people think that... Um, our user interfaces are going to continue to be bad and um, have a continued uh, expansion of scribes? Great question. And in fact, uh, there, is, there are a couple of papers written by Gellert in Texas, someone I don't know, but he's a very strong, uh, opinionated writer, author, and he claims that by using scribes, we're undermining the further development of EHRs, that we're stifling development of EHRs because the providers aren't getting after the vendors to make them better because they have this stopgap measure in place. And Dave Bates, I know, feels somewhat the same way. You know, he feels documentation processes have to be different in the United States. Uh, he, you know, has published a, paper, a study showing that uh, documentation in the U.S. is four times longer than elsewhere in the world. 
So we are definitely overburdened with documentation. But the other point in this commentary paper was that usability is so bad that until we do something about that or the vendors do something about that, we're going to need scribes. Follow up on that. One of the uh, one of the big factors with scribe use is their expense, of course, right? And and how and uh, many places it's kind of summarized as it's kind of relegated to the high productivity settings, right? Such that it's basically not affordable. So that kind of uh, that would make me doubt uh, this uh, Mr. Gellert's um, opinion that we've, we're still going to continue to have for a long time tons of users. Um, but I guess I'm curious, what, is, what have, you, uh, have you, have you guys touched on that factor and, or maybe even interviewed uh, folks who would like to have scribes but, but do not? Well, that's the scribe envy part. <laughs> uh, but the places we've been, they do seem to feel that there's a return on investment for scribes. And minimum wage is actually pretty cheap. Um, usually, Providers have to promise to see more patients every day. Uh, one place they had to promise to see one patient extra a day, another place three extra patients a day, and that's where the return on investment comes in because they really do make you more efficient no matter what your specialty. Aaron? Calling, calling scribes an unintended consequence of the design of each, each ours is, you know, very judgmental, right? And implies a whole bunch of assumptions that I'm not sure are tested or are true, such as even with the greatest documentation system with the most usability, that it's really the best use of the provider's time to be documenting and feeding that into the EHR. I don't know if that's true or not. So I guess the question that I have is in your discussions, did you hear anything that thought that there was a real problem with having scribes? Because almost everything that you said, you know, scribe envy and higher, you know, throughput and the provide. So you're, what I'm hearing from you is that the providers are happy to ha take on the responsibility of seeing an extra patient today so they can have a scribe. So if everybody's happy and more people are getting taken care of and the documentation is at least as good as it needs to be, what's the problem, even if we didn't think of it in advance and it winds up being a quote-unquote unintended consequence? Well, people still worry that having a third person in the room might make patients nervous. You know, we talk to people who say the press gainies and all um, pretty much say that the patients are fine with this, but there are times when they don't want that third person in the room. So that has to be handled really well. Uh, any team members here about the downsides of having scribes? Well, the cost is one. I think that's a worry. I think that's a worry. Chris, did you have? And then uh, an alert fires. There has to be some sort of a process to get that alert to the mind of the of the physician. Some take care of it. Some do the orders after. But if they really are uber efficient, sometimes that's assumed, and you lose some of that functionality. And at many places, the scribes are allowed to pen to orders. And so they're actually kind of doing orders. And so I think it is a risk um, that there are compliance and risk issues in that something could go wrong, in that the provider who's responsible may not be reviewing those pended orders very carefully. There's also a concern about the uh, documentation itself and having to correct it. And if a provider is having to uh, spend another extra time going over that documentation, then there may not be that much time saving. So, well, actually, this this last study by Mishra uh, and uh, Christine Sinsky's study have shown that there really are amazing time savings, and where a provider might have spent four hours. Uh, 
documenting after work, it's, it's down to a few minutes now. Um, okay, we're, we're actually running a little, little short. So um, you said there's, I, I think that the two of them are part of one presentation. Okay, so we, we actually have, um, we, we have time for a couple more uh, questions. Great talk. Sorry if this question sort of is coming out of left field, but I'm curious to know if you know the literature on what is the actual role of either electronic or written documentation in like the provider's ability to like deliver good care. Like, is there an actual role for like writing it down yourself or entering it into the EHR? And has anyone tried to study that in some sort of not that I know of, except that we have been told by providers when we interview them that sometimes um, they, f they miss that cognitive link between writing it down and they're more uh, prone to forget. Yeah, I mean, I imagine it's a wide distribution, right? Like before the age of HRs, like some providers, I'm sure, like were really meticulous and spent a lot of time writing stuff down because that's how they could remember it versus others like relied on other sort of like, you know, uh, uh, mental shortcuts to stay up on their patients. But it would just be interesting to know. And uh, that would be a great study. Um, I, I think Amelia's been trying to <laughs> ask a question for a while. Um, I was going off of what, what Bill said earlier. Has there been any work on kind of proto scribes or people who performed a role similar to what the modern scribe does before electronic EHRs. So the, it seems that a lot of the work the scribe is doing is not just taking the work off of handling a clunky interface, but just writing stuff down in any context is a chore and takes time. So was it just that physicians were going through writing things out by hand when they did, and then the extra inefficiencies of the EHR was just too much and that broke it, and that's why we went to scribes? Um, or were there people who were performing similar roles in terms of typing out the physician's note after a visit or office secretaries or someone in the old days that might have been doing something more similar to what the scribes are, that offloading some of that administrative work before we had our current system? You providers in the room, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in the old days there was just a lot less documentation. And more to the point, shorter, not all the requirements from the environmental pressures to do documentation. So there was just a lot less. And the EHR, in my theory, um, has enabled all of this extra documentation to come along. So, so I'm going to have to, um, uh, <laughs> I, well, I, um, I, I don't really want to cut everyone off, but, but actually I do want to um, um, give enough time and, and additional questions. Um, so um, Joan is always around, so if you want to uh, talk further with her um, about her work, she'll always be happy to talk to you. So thank you, Joan, and good luck. Thank you. <laughs> and there are team members around all the time, too. Yes, yes. Um, good. Okay. So um, I, our, our second presentation actually has two presenters. I didn't know that until a minute ago or a few minutes ago. Um, and um, so um, Connor and Becky are um, uh, finalists in the Amy a Student Design Challenge, which is uh, actually no, it's actually a different. Oh, it's a different design challenge. Yeah, it's the regular person design challenge. It's the yeah. it's not the student design yes. challenge. Not students. For okay. Is is it um, focused in a certain area? Or? Yes. It's uh, it's part of the ninth annual workshop on visual analytics and health. Okay, gotcha. Okay, well, um, but we, I think we do have a finalist in the student uh, design challenge as well, which I was just going to say, because you know how I like to brag about you guys, <laughs> um, that um, the first three years of the AMIA student design challenge, the three winning teams were from OHSU, um, and uh, now there's another um, group that uh, is a finalist this year. They're presenting their poster um, I think on Sunday, and um, hopefully they'll do well. Um, okay, well, and so maybe actually Connor and Becky can, uh, before they start, maybe tell us a little bit about 
the event, which now that you mention it, I remember reading about, but I, sorry, I conflated the two. Um, and, um, and then, so you're, you get 15 minutes to talk, so I'll time you and I'll um, give you a two minute warning as, as often people do at the uh, meeting. And it, it's always really important, especially for those of you who are not familiar with doing this, that if they give you 15 minutes to talk, that you be certain that you finished your talking within 15 minutes. Um, especially actually in a, in a contest. <laughs> um, okay, so why, why don't you go ahead um, and uh, l let me know when you're starting your actual talk and then um, I'll, I'll start my timer. Okay, so yeah, uh, we entered into, uh, to kind of get some background on this, we were working on an EPC project, uh, uh, a pilot project for ARC um, regarding uh, the visualization or alternative methods for disseminating systematic reviews. So we were working on that and then uh, Shane and actually sent out an email about a call for papers and it sounded like a good fit. So it's the ninth annual um, workshop in visual analytics and healthcare. It's a workshop that's split between, a uh, yearly split between uh, IEEE and AMIA. So it jumps in between those. Um, and this is their first year of doing a design challenge and so we are competing with five other teams, and the top three will get published in a special topics in visual analytics, so. And Stephen. Yes, and a uh, $200 gift card, so. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm actually gonna give it to Becky to oh. start us off. Thanks. And we actually have not gone through this at all, even between ourselves. <laughs> so this, um, this is, before we commit the a script to memory, we wanted to kind of tell the story first just to see if it makes sense, if it's coherent, if it's interesting, and then we'll actually practice, so. Oh, you do? Oh, oh no, go ahead, I don't care. All right, so, uh, and the point of me being up here is to introduce the systematic reviews and, and the research because we're presenting to an audience that I think isn't going to have a lot of background on that, and then we're gonna turn it over to Connor. Um, and so, I hope that the story is coherent, but I think the feedback that I would appreciate most is on the, the actual design portion of it, if that makes any sense. All right, let's get her started. So, so many of us are engaged in new research on an ongoing basis, but what is the actual purpose of that research? And it's really to create new knowledge. So when we're conducting research, we're taking evidence, we're taking observations, and we're contributing to our shared knowledge base in a particular health field. And in medical research, our long-term goal is typically to inform providers' decision-making um, so they can deliver evidence-based, effective quality care for their patients. But our contributions of research aren't magically integrated into practice. You know, we have to scrutinize to, to vet them and really come to a consensus. Uh, to make sure that we're doing what's best for the patient. And once a strong body of evidence has been established, then we can consider translating some of this research into actual practice. And often in the health system, uh, the incorporation of that takes the form of practice guidelines. So a major component of guideline development is actually a systematic review. So a systematic review is different from just a, a regular traditional review article in that you have this scientific approach to collecting information and synthesizing the information to answer specific questions. So the research questions are structured, uh, they're peer reviewed, and you have to follow an explicit and pre-specified protocol. So researchers are summarizing, they're synthesizing the data, they're evaluating the quality of the individual studies as well as the body of evidence as a whole. And these reviews are really complicated. They depend largely on what's even out there in the, in the body of literature, the quality of the studies as well as how are you defining the outcomes that you're going to be measuring? So along with these giant systematic reviews, as well as some pragmatic experience based on the clinicians, uh, you form and uh, develop guidelines for clinical practice. What led to this particular project? So currently systematic reviews, they're presented as these enormous static PDF documents online. Um, they're filled with tons of tables, charts, for example. So our Pacific Northwest Evidence-Based Practice Center at EPC, we completed a systematic review of non-invasive, non-pharmacologic treatments for chronic pain. The report was funded by uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, ARC, and it's available for download if you have a whole lot of time. The, so the full document itself, um, the reason we're putting this out is the full document was 1,398 pages. 
So 300 plus of those were the main body. You had over 1,000 pages in the appendix. Um, there was, let's see, within there we had a 25-page executive summary, which isn't exactly a summary, um, 62 tables, 52 figures, and, and all of these data came from 202 studies. So the point is to say that's a lot of material. That's a lot of material for anybody, let alone you know, a panel of really busy physicians, clinicians trying to read and digest uh, some important information before making guidelines that are going to guide how they practice. So what are some of the challenges? You've got this massive report, a lot of information, a lot of really good evidence, but it's really a lot to internalize. So uh, we're pretty good at taking the evidence and saying, you know, let's chunk this out, let's make this chapter, this chapter, and then make decisions based on that. But uh, this becomes a problem when you increase the dimensionality of a report. So for example, just in this tiny little report, we had five different types of pain, there were eight different interventions, and we had to look at these across six different outcomes. Um, so it's pretty difficult to look at a systematic review already, but when you increase it by all of these different dimensions, it's even more difficult. In addition, you've got this rigid structure. So PDFs, you can't do a lot with. You can maybe print out all the tables and, and cut and paste and arrange them how you want, but you're not gonna get a lot of um, good information quickly that way. So. The problem there is if you, if your question is what exa exactly what the research questions were in the systematic review, great, you have your answers. But if you're looking at something a little bit different, then you're going to have a lot of trouble finding the information that you need. So, so to take a look at this, ARC um, asked us to uh, the various CPCs across the country to look for potential methods for presenting the data from systematic reviews that would make these reports more accessible and more usable. The problem is definitely in the realm of informatics. Um, in that, uh, and, uh, sorry, the problem is definitely in the realm of informatics, but unfortunately, most CPCs don't uh, include an informatics uh, person on their staff. Luckily, the Pacific Northwest EPC uh, is pretty well integrated with DMICE here, and so we kind of have a, kind of an advantage at that point. So uh, this is essentially how we got integrated. Um, so we wanted to uh, engage um, EPCs to develop and pilot test potential tools to enhance the evidence uptake. From there, uh, what we did is we used the, as mentioned before, the published uh, report on chronic pain. And before we started, we kind of wanted to establish some selection criteria for whatever tool we would be using. As I mentioned before, not a lot of EPCs have informatics professionals, so building something in R or Python might not be exactly usable across the board. So instead, what we wanted to look is for an existing off-the-shelf product that had no or minimal need for informatics, for formal informatics training. Um, we wanted to, in, especially one that had a robust uh, customer support department. Uh, with these in mind, we ended up selecting Tableau. And one of the reasons behind that, too, is that Tableau is already pretty well integrated into uh, many health systems across the board. So it just kind of, it worked out well. So from here, as since it is a design challenge, we wanted to look at a demo of this. We essentially, for this, we kind of modeled the report after um, the standard in systematic reviews, which is a forest plot. It's not exactly the same, but you'll be able to tell if you've ever seen one before. Uh -huh. So this is um, published on uh, Tableau Public currently, um, and it's out there so you can take a look at it. It's a lot going on, and I know the text is very small on this projector, um, but essentially the way that it works is that it's split into a couple different sections. At the top, uh, you can see that there are some filters that you can use to kind of uh, break down those dimensions that we talked about earlier, different types of intervention, uh, the outcomes you're looking on, pain versus function, and the different conditions. From there, in this top section, you have the summary, which is going to be these aggregate measures of the studies that they found. Below, you're going to have the actual studies and details about those. Now, the main function of this is so that if you wanted to look at, say, chronic low back pain with exercise, uh, you're looking at exercise as an intervention compared to usual care, we want to look at the effect on function, we can kind of uh, subset these and it's going to provide a little bit more detail for us down here. So now we're only looking at these and down here you can see what makes up those 
aggregations. Uh, there's additional info within these boxes when you hover over. It tells you about the strength of evidence, the number of studies, number of patients, all those kind of things. Excuse me, all those kind of things. Um, so uh, in addition to this, uh, we also created a guided comparison, which is a nice uh, way to kind of show how someone would use this without being at a talk about how to use it. So at the top, we just put in some text talking about this tool is designed to allow you to look across different, um, look across the data in different ways that the report isn't designed to, uh, the original report isn't designed in a way for you to do that. Uh, for example, looking across the different interventions and kind of seeing how they work, um, how they are comparatively. So for this, uh, we decided to, let's look at exercise um, and the effect it has on pain. And you're gonna see it across different types of pain, all down here, and all the different studies involved with that. But say we wanna look more at the short-term effect on chronic low back pain. So we zoom in on that. And if we hover over this, we can look at that summary information. We can see that uh, there was 553 patients across six studies. The strength of evidence is moderate. And then if we want to look even further, we can look at a specific study. Down here, we can get a lot of information about it. We can get the actual patient information, the number of patients in each group, the control and intervention. And if we want to, we can even go and look at the abstract on PubMed. So uh, those are the, the main uh, parts of the report that we designed just so that we could get a better, uh, just an alternate method for looking at this data. So some caveats and limitations. We'll say this is definitely a supplement to the original report, it is not meant to replace. There's just so much information in those thousands of pages that you can't exactly get across in something like this. Um, another part is that this is really a quantitatively focused um, method for presenting the data. Um, so we haven't really met, we haven't tried playing around with any qualitatively focused, but um, I'm sure someone can figure out a way. Uh, lastly, even though this report is going to be more dynamic than the original one, it's still going to be pretty. Um, it's still going to be tethered to how you structure your data, how you collect your data, how you store it, how you aggregate it. All of that is going to define what eventually comes out in your um, your visualization. For us, one thing is we had to actually extract all of the data out of the PDF report uh, by hand, so that took some time, but that kind of shows that if it's not stored properly, you're gonna have a hard time dealing with that. Uh, so we just, uh, so from there, that's uh, this is what we've come up with at this point. Um, we believe that the project kind of shows an importance of, uh, and a potential benefit of integrating informatics into this kind of work. Um, we believe that this kind of a report can help improve dissemination of the data um, and increase accessibility and find new ways to present. On top of that, we do think that more research, we need to, we need to look at more ways to further increase the accessibility and different ways to present the data. Our setup is kind of limited to um, a very dense, uh, very dense data uh, visualization, and so it can be kind of tough on smaller screens, so we imagine that there could be a lot of different ways to present this as well. And that's it. Well, the good news is that you have about, you have almost four minutes uh, <laughs> extra time. Perfect. Which, and actually, um, well, I don't know if they give any guidelines on what you're supposed to talk about, because I, I can think of a couple areas that I probably mo probably most informatics people like me <laughs> would be interested in knowing more about. But mm -hmm. do, do they give you any guidelines on what you're supposed Zero. to say? <laughs> okay. Okay. That's why we just put this together and yeah. let's present it and see where people mm -hmm. can control our we, okay. we definitely thought the biggest part was kind of communicating why, you know, the why of why we care kind of thing and kind of telling the story of how we got to where we are with this. Um, I do know for the final presentations, they've, it's pretty rigid, at least in the schedule they've given. Each group only has 15 minutes, and I think, so that means anything happening in that 15 minutes is all you get. Okay. Yeah. I don't think there is any discussion. To, yeah. uh, it's, you just well, get 15 minutes, and then later in the afternoon, they do the judging. And, well, and what, they, won't, they won't have any time for Q&A from the audience? There's or? nothing listed on the yeah. schedule. Nope. Okay. So that's yeah. why we were 
yeah. not entirely sure and if it's, we could shorten it. Or yeah, and it's their first time doing the design mm -hmm. challenge, so I imagine mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a lot we could look at. To so so the, the, two, the two areas, uh, um, um, and, and I, I might not be your typical audience, uh, you know, because I am in DMICE and we do so much with systematic reviews. I've done systematic <laughs> reviews. Um, I, I kind of know, but, but I, I thought this, this telling the story was good. Um, I, I think one of the big questions, um, and it's things that informatics people think about, is um, going from the raw data in the studies, in the PDFs, um, to how you get it in and, and what it takes and what issues. You alluded at the end that, that you went through this all um, by hand, and you know there's probably a lot of people in the informatics people in the audience saying, oh my God, why do we have to do that? You know, we, um, it, you know it's like unscrambling eggs, as we sometimes say. The, the other thing that, um, other area, and I'll, I'll then pass the mic up to anyone else who has thoughts, um, is um, uh, I, I, you gave a nice demo on, on the features, but how would people actually use it? Who, who would mm -hmm. the actual users be? Um, you know, would it be clinicians uh, trying to find the best evidence to make mm -hmm. a clinical decision? Um, you know, would it be other researchers? Um, so maybe speaking to that a little bit might um, uh, uh, be useful because, I mean, usually when things are designed, they're designed with an audience mm -hmm. in mind. That's really good feedback. Thank you. Um, so on the topic of the, the scenario that you explored, which I think was really helpful because the tool, as you presented it, seems fairly, um, fairly seamless. And I think it might help to have a direct comparison to how you would answer that same mm. question without the tool, because that's going to really help surface um, the improved efficiency. Um, and I would imagine also potentially the, the ability to not just do it quickly, but do it correctly in getting mm. that information. So if you could just have like one or two slides where you say, okay, here's the question. If we were going to do this just with the PDF, we would start with this page and then that page, especially for the comparison you were talking about, which mm. would in in involve looking at, I would assume, several different <laughs> figures and... Across many different pages. Yeah. Exactly. Is that yeah. about printing out like a brick and just throwing it at people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know I if mean, we should print out the 1,400 page report. I don't know that us. you want to <laughs> commit physical violence, yeah. but <laughs> I do think that, that, away from that right? having that express comparison will really lend um, a lot of value to what you have put together, okay. which seems really impressive. I think this is really great as a visualization, as a tool to get this information. I think we just summarized what we were trying to say, like really yeah. well in the sentence. So excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I agree with what Bill and Nicole have said. I, just, I wondered, in addition, if you could, as long, well, two things. Number one, you know, looking in the future, you know, how much more automated could the creation of this be? But, but just for for now, for this. You know, what was the cost in terms of, you know, time or man hours to get to this level of interaction? Mm -hmm. And, you know, sort of what's the, you know, coupled with the use case example, kind of what's the cost benefit analysis? Because if this is a really great way of getting people to use systematic review evidence more effectively, maybe then that incremental cost, even if it's mostly manual right now, might be justified. Mm -hmm. um, so having some kind of estimate on how, you know, how long that it really took and how much effort it really was and how much effort it would take to do this on the next systematic review, mm -hmm. um, coupled with the sort of use case demonstration of, you know, here's the old clunky error prone way to do it and here's the new way to do it might, you know, sort of make the, you know, design challenge sort of more compelling. Mm -hmm. so, before you, are we allowed to say that like because the report so we actually did have to answer that exact question in the report, and I'm going to give you Ark's phone number so you can call him and tell him. Okay. <laughs> um, because I think that was one of the issues is, that was one of the things we recommended in the report is we need to actually do this, sorry, we need to actually do this from scratch, from the beginning, and implement this, integrate this into the systematic review to see how much time it would actually take because, like Connor said, we had to do this retrospectively, which was a giant pain. Sure. The biggest, yeah, the but biggest. remember where you're starting from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I've worked with systematic review groups for many years, and it's very difficult to change their processes quickly. 
for a lot of good reasons, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so for the near term, coming up with this kind of thing will likely be based on the artifact that they produce them mm -hmm. in the systematic review right now. Maybe not the PDFs, maybe you know, the stuff they base the PDFs on and, and whatnot. Um, so at least, you know, estimating how long it took you, but this is an upper bound of that. Mm -hmm. And then being more integrated with the systematic reviews, you know, would push that cost down over time. And at some point, you know, you'd get to steady state until we have a technological innovation or you get more automation or something. So I still think that that, you know, that that would be useful. You know, what's the, what's the cost benefit right now? And then your opinion of where that could go in the future with stuff X, Y, Z, you know, maybe, maybe just not using the PDFs, but using the, you know, Excel tables that they've already extracted stuff out with saving a certain amount of time and, you know, whatever that would be. Yeah. Yeah, this is the worst case scenario, but it might be that even the worst case scenario is valuable, valuable mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, compared to just doing the review by reading three or four pages of paper. Mm -hmm. I think in another setting, you mentioned that you guys had done some uh, qualitative or sort of usability uh, trials with mm -hmm. providers. Are, are you going to bring that forward here? Because I, I think that would be really interesting information. Um, I was actually let me confer with my colleague. <laughs> <laughs> um, Elaine? Thoughts? Well, we did interviews of OHSU guideline developers, kind of demoed what was set up and um, solicited input on how that might have been more helpful to them in their process of developing guidelines. So kind of just floated across the top of those waters, but definitely that's something to explore further to that clinical scenario that I'm trying to imagine, a physician, how would they use this? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think this, for this project, we really focused on guideline developers um, who are taking the systematic review data and basically boiling it down to, okay, this is what the evidence shows, and then now providers here is what you should do with your patients. So kind of that intermediary, you know, broker of the research, as it were. Um, rather than being focused so much on the direct provider. But that was kind of, that was one of the points we learned was right. that we're not entirely sure a direct provider could use this unless they were really an expert, like a subject matter expert or something. So then it's, okay, what do we do as the next steps? But, um, so I think that's a really good point. And to toot Connor's horn, the, uh, I think ARC was really, they demonstrated yesterday, you know, one of the ways that they want to go forward is potentially using a workbook similar to the one that Connor developed in Tableau. So he's kind of a big deal at ARC. Um, yeah, actually, I didn't, um, yeah, that, that makes sense, I mean, in terms of a, a guideline developer in, in terms of this. You know, actually, I was, uh, th there's a famous picture, in fact, I've probably used it in several courses of mine, of, of the uh, a physician in Great Britain in like the late 1990s had. Um, uh, kept every um, guideline that had been mailed to him for like a year. And so there's a picture. It was actually published in British Medical Journal, this stack of guidelines, you know, coming off literally like this this high, you know, which, of course, uh, makes them essentially useless. So, um, uh, to, And obviously tools like this uh, are, are helpful. So, okay, well, um, and you guys are presenting on Saturday afternoon for people who are there. Um. <laughs> Good point. And Joan, when is your crazy month? Okay, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. And then, and then this is the downside to the ANIA meeting. I of course have like at least two conflicts during those times, but I, I will do what I can. Anyways, uh, thank you and and good luck and um, thank you all.